Welcome to the second session of the Pres President's Forum. Uh, this one, of course, d devoted to influence and impact implicitly in an unequal world. And this will be chaired by Sandra Almeida. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you, Peter. Good morning, everybody. So we are going to start now the second uh, session of this uh, very important topic, uh, President Forum 2022, Addressing Inequalities in Higher Education and Research. I would just like to make a comment. I just came from Barcelona, uh, in which uh, we was held the UNESCO 2022 uh, Conference on World Higher Education. And um, it's interesting to observe that the topic that was discussed there was exactly the futures of higher education, a new social pact, a new way of dealing with higher education around the world. And one of the major topics was exactly access and inequality. And one of the mottos, UNESCO mottos, is leave no one behind. So exactly some of the issues that we are addressing here today. So uh, this session, so another thing that uh, we, was discussed in the World Higher Education Conference was the fact that higher education should be considered a public and social good and also a human right. So it should not be considered a commodity because it has to do with people's right and access to higher education. So some of the topics that we have also been addressing in this panel. Uh, this panel today is going to, as Mike, as uh, Peter pointed out, is going to discuss access to impact and influence. How do we address inequality, considering considering the need for us to have and to show community impact, influence, relevance, and engagement. And also, uh, this, this session also looks at how there are inequalities in being able to influence the global agenda depending where the university are. So if the universities are in the south or in the north, so that the kind of impact they are going to have is going to differ slightly. So I have here uh, with me today four panelists. Uh, the first one, and I would like to uh, invite him to the fore, and uh, let me read this, the information that we have on him. Hold on a second, where is it? Okay. The first one is Dirt Tladi, Professor of International Law from the University of Pretoria. Dirt Tladi is Professor uh, at the University of Pretoria with several articles, books, and publications. He's a member of the UN International Law Commission. It's uh, current chair and is a special rapporteur on preemptory norms. He's also a member of the Institut de Droit International and a two-time Fulbright grant holder. He was previously a lawyer for the South African Foreign Ministry and legal counsel for the South African Permanent Mission to the United Nations in New York. Subsequently served as advisor to foreign minister from 2014 to 2018. Tatladi's latest work of fiction, he's also a writer, is Sins of the Father. Professor Tladi, with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, thank you for the invitation. It really is wonderful to be here. Um, I, I listened very carefully to the panel before me. A lot of the issues that were mentioned really touched me. Um, um, the kinds of issues that have been spoken about are the kinds of issues that at least in the last couple of years um, I've thought really, really hard about. So it's, 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 um, it's, it's really wonderful to be here, and I'm really honored um, for this invitation. I'm very sorry I couldn't be with you for the last couple of days. I believe you've had a, also a very fruitful um, um, conference and, 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 and conversation, um, and it's really wonderful to be here. Uh, a couple of years ago, two years ago, at the height of the pandemic, um, um, the, the university in asked me, invited me to give a... Um, I guess it was sort of the university's attempt, if you like, to, to start living a normal life, to you know, make the best out of a very strange situation. Um, and the university asked me to deliver the first uh, expert lectures after the pandemic had started. Um, and it was a hybrid one, and I believe it was the first hybrid one. And, and I chose, for some reason, I chose as a topic of that presentation, I chose um, the topic of solidarity. Um, as I was preparing for that expert lecture, it dawned on me 
that a lot of the things that I was saying were actually um, really a theme running through my research since um, the late 1990s when I became an academic, uh, at least when I initially became an academic. Um, and so since then I've tried to, to make solidarity um, a more explicit and express um, theme in my work. So the last two years, uh, my work has more, more um, explicitly focused on this notion of solidarity. Um, I say all of this because uh, I think that the answers to any question of inequality and equity always lies in solidarity. I was struck by Sue's response to Jeffrey's question, which is a very radical response. But really what it is, is it's, a, it's the only way to deal with this issue is through solidarity. We have to do it together. There's no way that one university, one academic, and so on, the only way that you can do it is through solidarity. Um, so that's really why I think that um, uh, the notion of solidarity is so important for addressing um, all of this question. And I have no doubt that um, even with respect to our panel, which is um, access um, to impact and influence, solidarity is the key. Now the question, of course, is how to make this real, how to make the solidarity um, key. When you're thinking about impact and influence. I guess there's two ways that you can think about it, at least from my perspective, um, at least when I was thinking about this topic two days ago, because I wasn't quite sure that it was still happening. There was some uh, miscommunication. But in any event, so when I thought about the topic, I thought impact and influence, um, there's at least two ways that one could do the talk. So one could do the talk about research. That's the easiest for academics, right? So think about the extent to which your research impacts the world. Um, but I figured somebody would talk about that, and indeed I was right in the morning panel, that's what was discussed. So I won't talk about impact of research in terms of publication, who reads it, who has, um, who has um, so access to the quote-unquote leading journals. Instead, I'll talk about something else. I'll talk about impact on policy and policy institutions. So that's what I want to talk about, impact on policy and policy institutions. In my own area, of course, and that's the easiest way to talk about this, is to talk about my own area and things that I know so I can share with you some, some anecdotes, maybe a uh, better word for anecdotes is experiences of how there is inequality and inequity in access of it to impact and influence of um, policy um, and policy institutions. Um, I didn't prepare any global statistics. As I said, I prepared um, just uh, some thoughts about my own experiences, my own anecdotes that sort of show the level of inequity um, and inequality when it comes to, um, to impact. Uh, before those experiences though, so, so one question that I would start off with is, well, what's the purpose of a university? I think the purpose of a university is knowledge creation, but a number of the panelists in the morning um, have emphasized that it's not just knowledge creation, it's knowledge creation towards a particular goal, right? It's, it's knowledge creation towards making the world better for its inhabitants. Quite apart from the normative desirability of making sure that there's equitable access to impact and influence, the goal of knowledge creation for a better world is always, I think, made much easier, much better when there are different thoughts, when there's diversity in thought. And so in a sense then, access to impact and influence also enhances um, 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 uh, the broader objective, if you like, of, of, of um, um, the purpose of a university. So I'd like to, to, to influence this lack of equity uh, in access and impact through some of the experiences, as I have said. Um, in my world, that is the world of international law, um, nothing, um, nothing sets up graduates from universities like internships. I often have students coming in and asking me, how can we be a part of your world? How can we join the United Nations? How can we be involved in court decisions in International Court of Justice? There's absolutely nothing that makes that path open easier than internships. Um, so I've been a member of the International Law Commission since 2012, and in that period I've had, I'm just gonna have a look at here and see, I've had 23 assistants, uh, and I've got some numbers here that I just want to look at. Um, of the 23 assistants that I've had, one um, came from Africa. Um, that's up to this year. Um, so from 2012 to 2021, 
One has come from Africa. Three, come, three have come from Asia, and, and I should say when I say Asia, in fact, what I mean in this context is I mean China, right? So three have come from China. Um, three have come from Latin America, right? Uh, the rest have all come from New Zealand and the United States, right? So, so out of um, 23, seven have come from the global south, and the rest have come from the global north. That number, seven out of 23, is pretty bad already, but it actually gets even worse. Um, so if you peel back the layer from that number and you sort of look at it much closer, of the three Asian and Latin American students that came to assist me, uh, zero were coming from their home universities, right? So of the three Asian and Latin American, sorry, um, so of the three Asian and Latin American um, uh, assistants that were there to assist me, zero were coming from directly from their home institutions. Uh, all of them came either from <clears throat> New York University or the Graduate Institute in Geneva. And of course, you can th think of the reasons um, 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 why this is the case. This picture is the same for all members of the commission. It's not just me, right? So not a single member of the commission can paint a different story. The story is exactly the same from every member of the commission. Now, if I were to look at the numbers for 2022, they would look much better. Uh, but that's only because I've recently received some funding through my chair, which enabled me to bring students from the Global South. So this year, for example, I have um, three students from my own university, so all of them African. Um, and I have uh, another two students from India and another two students from Latin America, right? But that's an exceptional scenario. Um, um, uh, now, I'm sure we all know why these numbers are so skewed. Um, it's because of funding. Um, so the New York University has a particular program, or at least New York University Law School has a program. Every law student that enters that university is guaranteed funding for whatever institution that will accept them to do internships. So that's why there's so many interns from NYU. Um, and that's, so they join the UN Office uh, of Legal Affairs, they join the International Law Commission if they can find uh, a special rapporteur willing to work with them, they join the International Court of Justice. So they have all of this access to influence um, uh, and impact. Uh, so my university now, Professor Cooper said to me, you must tell them the University of Victoria is very influential. But I'm sure we couldn't afford that, right? I don't think UCT could afford that. Uh, to make sure that every law student has funding available to go to whatever institution that will accept them. Obviously, the, so the student, first of all, has to prove themselves. But if you can find an institution, we will place you there. Huh? We will fly you to Geneva. We will, so I'm here now for, what is it, 12 weeks. We'll fly you to Geneva, pay your per diem for 12 weeks, every law student. Um, so it takes funding. Um, the problem, by the way, is not only the International Law Commission and the placement of students from Northern University. Um, if you look at the organizations, the organs in Geneva, you find uh, a similar kind of thing. Internships in international organizations aren't paid. So if you're going to intern, even if that institution is willing to accept you, you have to have funding for yourself. Um, so in other words, you have to fly yourself there and you have to be able to live there in, in times, because internships, for example, for the UN um, High Commissioner for Human Rights is six months, so you have to be able to, to feed yourself, uh, house yourself for six months in Geneva on your parents' um, RAND-based salary. Impossible. Uh, that's certainly impossible for the University of Pretoria, imp impossible for the University of Kinshasa, impossible for the University of Johannesburg, impossible for, for Cape Town. Um, there are other ways that you could look at this. So the UN has a program uh, which is called the Junior Professionals, the Junior Professional Officers Program, JP JPO. Um, and basically how this program works is as follows. Uh, a state, a country would uh, set aside a particular amount of money and give it to the United Nations, and, and they would say, for this amount of money, we are expecting that you will hire young graduates from our country. Right? Uh, again, it doesn't take much imagination to think about um, um, 
which states are likely to, to be able to, to offer this kind of um, opportunities for their graduates. Um, so all of these opportunities, of course, go to northern states, northern universities, uh, particularly countries that have taken advantage of this, the Nordic countries, uh, um, so Italy, we haven't taken advantage of it. So what all of this does is it creates opportunities, it creates uh, uh, ch chances that students, that graduates from southern universities will never have, um, that students from northern universities um, will have. Um, of course, this problem is not a new problem. I heard somebody saying um, that uh, the particular issue that they were discussing has been discussed for the last 30 years. Uh, at least since I've been on the commission, this is an issue that we have all thought about. Um, a colleague of mine who um, sadly passed away uh, two years ago, a year ago. Um, so we had often discussed about how to make it possible for us to bring at least our own graduates. Um, um, so so th this issue has been thought about for a long time, but there aren't any sustainable solutions. At least no one has thought about a sustainable solution. Notice how I'm already preempting Dawana's question about, yes, you've told us the problems, but how do you resolve it? I mean, I don't have any particular solutions. Uh, there, are certainly, um, there are certainly within UN agencies already talk about this. So uh, some UN agencies are now offering um, at least some stipends, which um, um, uh, will partly relieve this. Uh, there are some states which in their J JPO programs and JPO funding um, have said if you take 50% from our population, then 50% can go to a developing country. But none of these, of course, are, are sustainable um, um, uh, solutions. They're all, if you like, a drop um, in the ocean. One thing, I mean, I think that the universities themselves haven't really thought about this, uh, and I don't know if this is something that um, the World University Network um, has thought about. In the course of the morning, I had a conversation with Alicia, and Alicia said something which I actually thought this might be, uh, this might create somewhat of a, um, uh, um, a possible start to a sustainable solution. Uh, so imagine that somebody was applying for a grant, uh, for a UNESCO grant, uh, some sort, and I wondered whether or not one way around this, one way to, to encourage, or one way to alleviate this problem of impact and access from just a particular group of states, um, is if grants shouldn't, as a matter of course, already provide for the possibility of um, internships um, and placements. So in other words, within a grant funding, an amount is um, circled or earmarked for this kind of um, activity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Tladley, for the talk, for the excellent talk on seeking impact and access through solidarity and also uh, equality and opportunities for grant and internships. Now we, are, we have a presentation. It's an online presentation. Um, can we? Uh, yes, Professor Ellen Hazelcorn, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to introduce Professor Ellen Hazelcorn. He's a, she's a joint managing partner, BH Associates Education Consultants, and she's Professor Emeritus from Technological University of Dublin and joint editor, Policy Reviews in Higher Education. She's also a research fellow in the Center for International Higher Education, Boston College, and affiliated to the Center for Global Higher Education from the University of Oxford. She is a member of Inter Alia, Quality Board for Icelandic Higher Education, the Commission for the College of Future, UK. She was policy advisor to the Higher Education Authority in Ireland and vice president of Dublin Institute of Technology for almost 20 years. She was consultant at OECD for almost 10 years. She has also worked with international organizations and government for over 20 years. Recently, Ellen was UNESCO lead to develop five-year higher education policy and action plan for Lebanon, and also UNESCO coordinator in develop, development higher technical education in six Africa countries and academic advisor for a project on develop new model for higher education financing for Georgia. 
Ellen is internationally recognized for her writings and analysis of the influence of rankings on higher education and policy. Uh, Helen, it's with you. Okay, thank you all very much. And um, I'm very sorry I'm not with you um, today. It's, or indeed over the time, I'm sorry, conflict of different meetings all at the same time. But um, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to talk to you about rankings and inequality. This is not least on the, on the back of the UNESCO conference in Barcelona, but um, it's a timely topic anyway. It, we're almost 20 years for the anniversary of global rankings if we mark that with the um, establishment of the academic rankings, the Shanghai rankings. And it coincides with increasing um, government and policy shifts towards discussing the role and mission of higher education and particularly focusing on the contribution and impact or public value for society. So in my short talk, I wanna say, talk about three different questions and um, focus on one, what have we learned about rankings after 20 years? Do they measure what's meaningful? And, do, and where do we go from here? Are they still relevant? Um, so in the first instance, and some of this you, you clearly know, the wide emergence and use of rankings, particularly global rankings, accelerated at the turn of this century. And they were arguably a logical response to the increased heightened massification, student mobility, social and middle-class aspirations, and opening borders, along with the increasing importance of knowledge. And for nations, universities, especially research-intensive universities, have become an indicator of their global positioning in a changing global economy. Today, there's almost 20 global rankings and many, many more regional, national, and specialist rankings. Most of them are commercial products. An underlying assumption of rankings is that higher education institutions are comparable, although unequal in quality and performance. And so what we've seen over the last no number of years or many years is a series of excellence and other policy and institutional initiatives, which have um, been developed in order to alter this narrative in which a few universities will be at the top of the global hierarchy either by creating new universities, merging or upgrading, or indeed playing around with resource allocation models within universities. In the global era, perceptions of quality depend on comparability and measurability. And I focus on the word perceptions. Despite presenting themselves as an instrument to enhance student and parental choice, the real value of rankings has been to put higher education within an international comparative framework. The international landscape is a relational space and ranking success lies in the fact that they have challenged claims of, of excellence, whether it's by nations, universities, or indeed individuals, and using so-called scientific data and highlighting comparative and competitive advantages and disparities. And in this sense, they've also tracked the emergence of a global and highly networked science system and the global political shifts they're in. Most notably, and as we know, and in 2003, China had no universities in the top 100. By 2021, it had seven. In comparison, the US had 58 in 03, but only 40 in 2021. This is from the Shanghai rankings, which is the most consistent in its use of, of indicators. Most importantly, rankings highlight a pipeline of universities and scholars coming from a very diverse set of countries. So in 03, there are only 39 countries um, tracked in the rankings, but by 2021, there were 63. The US and Europe still dominate, but what we see is a very dynamic and multipolar space, still unequal, but certainly a lot of countries and scholars involved. As we reach the end of the second decade of this century, or the be enter the second decade, there are a new set of challenges, hyperglobalization creating increasing inequalities, especially but not only within developed countries and the, and the effects of COVID, 
and the pand and the invasion of, of Ukraine having other impacts. Technological changes, fourth industrial revolution, bringing huge changes to work and life. Demographic changes, people um, staying older, um, longer um, issues of the global talent pool, and particularly the rise of nationalism, exceptionalism, populism, and social unrest. Too many people feeling they've been left behind. All of these issues and challenges have changed the policy landscape and in turn are focusing on the role and mission of higher education. The millennium years have been dominated by this pursuit of world-classness. Where haven't we seen that term used around everything? be it universities, what universities do, what they claim to do, and so on. It's been an ambition and a strategy in many governments, um, in national strategies, and in many universities, and remains so. But is the race for individual and global reputation, how much has it been pitted against service to society? And is that still relevant? So up front, I want to say what's certainly very obvious. There's no such thing as an objective ranking. And I'm afraid I have to say that repeatedly because people think that somehow there's some scientific basis to them. There's no international agreement on indicators. There's no agreement around data, what data to use, or how to define the data definitions. There's no international database. Indeed, that's a bigger question about who owns this data. But the choice of indicators and weights belong to the rankings, to ranking companies, and it's their value judgments. They principally measure research and reputation. And if you add research and related indicators, such as um, PhD awards, research income, citations, um, internationalization, then Shanghai and Times are 100% research oriented. And QS, and I'll stick with those three, is 70%. QS and, and Shanghai devote 50% of their score to reputation. QS relies on reputational surveys, which are overly subjective, self-perpetuating, and easily conflated with quality and institutional age. You only know those institutions you know. Rankings aren't a meaningful measure of teaching either. They can't measure teaching it. Um, at, at scale as distinct from the outcomes of learning. And we haven't agreed what they are. And the Times attempts to measure teacher quality through surveys of, peer review, of peers. Now, tell me how that works. US News uses a selectivity index for which is 7%. It effectively measures a big index in the US. It effectively measures how good a university is in keeping students out. In other words, being a gatekeeper rather than a gateway. And, the U and, other, and it also rewards institutions for enrolling students with the highest standardized test scores. And we know a huge debate around standardized testing. Nor do they measure um, internationalization, they focus on mobility, and mobility is an elite activity undertaken by 2.6% of students worldwide. So essentially, rankings measure the outcomes of historical advantage. Elite universities and, benef and nations benefit from accumulated public and private wealth and investment over decades, if not centuries. They have better faculty-student ratios and per-student expenditure and investment compared with newer or public institutions or less wealthy countries. They benefit from attracting high achieving socioeconomic students who graduate on time and go on to have successful careers, and in many cases, engage then in private giving. This speaks to the fundamental problem with rankings, their methodology. They measure whole institutions and use indicators to measure all measure use the same indicators to measure all. And then they, when they go on like this, what we've got now is, but rankings will say that they're not measuring all institutions. However, in reality, they are because of the incentives that are, are um, placed in terms on governments and on institutions. And indeed, they use the 
they use by students. So how, where do we go from here? The first thing to say with respect to rankings and equality or inequality is to note that the top 100 universities represent only 0.5% of the number of institutions worldwide and only 1.4% of total students worldwide. And in the US, only 6.5% of US students or 4% of students in Europe. So we're dealing with a fraction. The US institutions in the top 20 would dominate and become a, um, a lead for everyone else to follow, 11 of which are private with endowments that surpass the higher education budgets of many countries. And it's important to keep in mind, our nation students do not attend these institutions. The second thing is to look at the research and which is primarily what they are and the big debate that is going on around the use of high impact journals and impact factors and the way in which it's now distorting um, the whole area of research. Indeed, such concerns have been raised both by DORA, the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment, and the Leiden Manifesto. We've seen action taken place by Dutch universities and by the Chinese government, and that precedes the fact that three universities, including one of your members, has now withdrawn from participating in rankings and questions being asked about using citation counts. The EU is moving towards next generation metrics. And indeed what we've seen is increasingly looking at the policy emphasis is on societal impact and engagement, just the issues that UNESCO was pointing to last week. So it's not just looking at the commercialization of research and patents, that's just a narrow part of impact what we're talking about societal impact and civic engagement, the way in which universities engage fully and holistically with the communities in which they, in which they live, not with elite partners elsewhere around the world, the contribution they make to public discourse, the help they make in building sustainable communities and so on. In the EU, the issue of smart specialization is a key issue in terms of building regional capacity and trying to overcome huge disparities between urban and rural, which are magnifying inequalities of opportunity. So where does that leave us? Academic culture is still focused on elite models and self-reflective models of accountability. They use their rank to amplify their own standing and widen the gap between cost and price. In the US, a university's ranking increases. As a university's ranking increases, the number of applications increases and the share of families, of students from low income families decreases. So the public is justifiably asking whose interests are colleges and universities serving? And are we still focused on the number of universities and being in the top 20 and what? are the top 100. So it's important, I think, to first of all, to say that on the issue of rankings, there are no efforts, there is no useful effort to be taken in trying to reform them. So if we only found better indicators or more appropriate one, this would solve the problem of inequality. No, it won't. The methodology is part of the problem, but it's not the whole problem. And indeed, at this stage, the methodology is what it is, and rankings are a hugely successful business model for the, for the ranking companies publishing and data analytics. Secondly, it's important to note that, as some people claim, equality and excellence don't go together. That's not true. Equality and excellence are not mutually exclusive, nor is being place-based and socially engaged exclusive from being globally competitive, despite what people say. And there are, there are interesting examples to look at. Washington Monthly College Guide is a kind of an interesting um, take on, on Kennedy's kind of what you do for your country um, type thing. It looks at mobility, research, and opportunities for public service. And within it, historically, black colleges and universities rank higher 
than, uh, than they would in the US news re uh, report because of the equity measures. You've got U multi rank, which is the EU initiative. Okay, it's not as sexy as, as um, the other rankings, but it attempts to do something that the others don't do. Then there's a range of other types of, of issues. But the sole um, problem is that, that rankings themselves are not a suitable and strategic tool for either governments or institutions. They drive policies that increase inequality because they leave too many learners behind and, in, and along with that, their institutions and communities. Besides the cost of continued investment is so high, the gap widens. So increasingly what we see is that excellence is measured according to what universities do, not what they call themselves or not how they're ranked. As Craig Calhoun, former director and president of uh, the London School of Economics um, pointed out, public support for universities is only given and maintained according to their capacity, capability, and willingness to educate citizens in general, to share knowledge, to distribute it as widely as possible in accord with publicly articulated purposes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen, for bringing such an important topic and uh, about rankings and inequalities, and also uh, to make us think about um, uh, equality and excellence as being two possible uh, issues that we can address, and also uh, how the rankings are related to a business model that uh, we are all tied to in some ways, and uh, how can we think outside that logic. So thank you very much for the excellent uh, talk. Uh, now we are going to have our third speaker, Yojana Sharma. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, Yorjana Sharma is Asia Director of the online publication University World News. She was previously a foreign correspondent for global news agencies and major newspapers, including the Daily Telegraph, Sunday Telegraph, Sydney Morning Herald, with positions in Geneva, Brussels, Central America, Hong Kong, China, New Delhi, and Berlin, before returning to London as an international affairs writer and commentator for the Times Educational Supplement. She's a specialist contributor to major news outlets, including BBC's Knowledge Economy series and Nature Index, and writes regularly for the UC Cordis website on cutting-edge cutting science. Please. Thank you, Professor Almeida. So I, like many people uh, in this room, was in Barcelona last week. And one of the things that struck me most was not just that they had um, uh, their proposals or roadmap uh, for to 2030, but there were also a lot of um, discussions about the future of higher education to 2050. But when I talked to university leaders um, while I was in Barcelona, I realized that actually it was much more urgent than all that. So I'm going to talk about the impactful university and inclusion Universities need to be relevant to all, which means the way universities do things and the way they interact with society and with policy tech makers should resonate with everyone. And this is what I brought back from Barcelona. They must do this before it's too late, before the next crisis is upon us. So I want you to retain at the back of, the mind, of your mind that this is not something you can leave to another day, something you can think about, talk about, and write papers about all the things that universities are really good at. It has to start now because inclusion doesn't happen by itself, and it can take time. It can take a very long time, and I think the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States tells us how very long it has taken and how very long it could take. The way to start now is to have inclusion and diversity in your mind, whatever you do. The World Bank and other international institutions have a word for it. They call it mainstreaming. Um, without that, you can't hope to have any kind of impact societally, and for that matter, globally. 
But before ensuring relevance to all, which, which means including all, let me first talk about whether universities can even have an impact on policy pertaining to social issues in their midst, whether it's mental health, including student mental health, or Black Lives Matter, or global problems like climate change, SDGs, future pandemics, food security, and the like. These are all things that require a concerted effort. No one country, and certainly no single institution, can have an impact that can help change course, not nationally, not regionally, not globally. One of the major lessons from the global pandemic is that the university has to be more flexible, and they have to be more connected, for example, with health departments. But how they do that is not always clear, and probably should happen differently in different universities and in different groups of universities to ensure all in the group have a say and contribute to the impact of the group as a whole. I'll come back to this bit later. But what is clear is that there is a good way to have an impact and there's a not so good way to have an impact or even a bad way. The bad way in a time of crisis is not to be acting for the good of all and the good of all your students and faculty because if you can't do that, how can you act for the good of all society? You should be asking yourself, who are you leaving out and why? And they will already be upfront and loud about it. Why are you leaving us out? In fact, that's in fact exactly what happens on campuses around the world. And it can snowball very quickly and get very angry. Why are you leaving them out? So there you have an issue. Let's face it. Political attempts to try and fix problems are not always successful. So higher education needs to step up as generators of knowledge, coming up with innovations and solutions for others, including governments, to implement. Universities have the best qualified human capital in the country, whether it's a rich country or a poor country. The pandemic was an eye-opener for many university leaders. Some understood only for the first time, as they rushed online, who had equipment and who did not. Let me, please let me quote <laughs> Chancellor, <laughs> Vice Chancellor Dawn Freshwater, who I spoke to at the time as part of an article about women heads of universities as in the first year of the pandemic. And she said to me, disadvantages pay, faced by minority groups be, became even more stark during the pandemic. And I quote, many universities are saying this, We've learned where the gaps are. We know that inequalities exist. And COVID has highlighted where they are in more detail for us to be able to respond. She's among us now, so I'm very glad to be able to say that she is right. Having to go beyond what they normally do, universities had a chance to prove, some, prove themselves for the good of all. Universities around the world came to the fore during the pandemic they had experts not just in public health, not just in microbiology, but also sociology, psychology, urban planning, and many other areas that are relevant. And some governments really relied on universities for that. And universities stepped up, particularly those that already had a, a relationship with government. So now, two and a half years later, we can see some of the effects. Prior to the pandemic, if the research was oriented towards real social issues, people were able to respond much, much quicker. If they were flexible, maybe you did not re do research on that before, but you change your research to that under the guidance of others, they were even more able to, uh, to respond. Many doctors tell me that whatever their speciality that they had practiced for maybe 30 years or more, they suddenly had to become experts in respiratory illness and immune disorders as their hospitals became overloaded. So, the university proved its value in those countries in which they were heard and at different levels of government. In some countries, experts of different disciplines came together and were really good, mutual, objective, high-level advisors to government. I will name here Jamaica and Argentina, which both implemented specialized committees to guide the governments to take decisions with mu as much evidence as was available. They had academics, experts on epidemiology, people from the private sector, so that their government was able to make the best decisions it could, listening to the experts and relying on science to move forward with their national response, relevant to all. But if I may say so, because 
we have Professor Almeida, who's from Brazil. Uh, Brazil was in a very bad way. The government was completely oblivious to anything the scientists said. Mexico was another ex bad example, and it was reflected in their outcomes, hospitalization costs, risks to the economy, but first and foremost in lives lost. Governments like this just don't want to see the value of universities. For these people, it's not enough that universities have now proven themselves during the pandemic and many other situations. But universities now themselves know that they can have impact. So now universities can project themselves with self-confidence. And yes, they may still have to fight to be heard, but they have a better chance of influencing change if they do so, to get, do so together as a group with this collective newfound confidence. What struck me about universities' wider response to the pandemic, whether it was developing con a contact tracing app, uh, becoming quarantine centers, or helping to roll out vaccines on their premises, is that they saw it as their natural role, even if they'd never done it before. They believe intrinsically that they can be engines of social development, and by extension, sustainable development. And because they reach out to their local communities in times of direst need, they know better than anyone who needs help, who gets that help, and who is left out. In fact, many of them are engines of, no of inclusion, whether they know it or not. And sometimes they know it better than their own government. Let me give you the example of the Philippines, the country most affected by natural disasters in the Asia Pacific, possibly the world. After severe disasters like typhoons that caused devastating damage, the, DNA, the country relied on university laboratories in outlying islands and portable DNA kit, testing kits to be brought out to identify bodies. With so many islands the Philippines has spread out of a large, around a large area and communications to the center and between the islands disrupted, it was the universities that provided disaster relief. And before that, they tracked weather conditions and provided local alerts, alerts which helped save many lives. Now I'm thinking about a country like Indonesia, and I think Brazil is the same. Often a new university is the only one that can make things happen in terms, for example, of trying to solve or help solve local or regional problems through science. They may be setting up infrastructure, maybe incubators, support to nurture entrepreneurs. They go beyond their own students and staff acting as engines of local and regional development. And what is unique about some of these universities is that they see it as their role and they would have even more potential and even more talent if they could share their experience and expertise further afield. Those kinds of uni excuse me, universities can help other universities who maybe serve a homogenous or perhaps elite clientele to understand who is out there and how to ensure you serve the whole community and not just those who've walked through your haloed doors. Yet it is often the wealthiest universities, those with huge research, research funds, the most select and often privileged student bodies, faculties who themselves went to the best universities who may be blind to who else is out there. Yet these are the ones, and you don't have to see the film Don't Look Up, to know this, who are listened to most by the powers that be. They could learn a thing or two about how to be relevant to all, and they could learn it from the struggling, remote, yet humble universities that are street smart because they know their neighborhood and who exactly resides in it. They are the ones who are closer to their indigenous communities or other rural or disadvantaged groups, but they may be far from government Connecting with such universities can help inform universities close to power about diversity and bring it to their own government's attention. Collaboration between universities has become more important than ever in order to scale up in expertise and to have an impact. Cooperation is not just for student exchanges or for research collaboration. Students and researchers are very eager to get international experience. But even universities that are in the same city can inhabit completely different worlds. But the point is that they need each other, and they need each other to jointly have impact and influence, not just within their own region, but with other regions and across the globe, 
because the SDGs is a global issue. The pandemic has provided an a window of opportunity for universities and scientists to talk to government. Channels have opened up, even if briefly, and they have got to know each other. I have spoken to many universities in the Pacific Rim where channels were opened up between universities and their governments and emergency services and others, for example, with drugs companies and other private companies for exchange of information for the benefit of all in a crisis situation. Maybe you no longer need to meet weekly as you did, or monthly. Perhaps you could make it three or maybe four months to keep that channel from slamming shut again. But what if your government is one of those that didn't choose to listen? Or what if you're a country that is simply too small or at a university trying to stretch that limited budget that they have just to get by with the basics, or simply does not have the capacity for the kind of research that that country needs. And this is what I mean by inclusion on a global scale. The only way to move forward is through collaboration and cooperation. Find universities that have access to those open or half open channels and establish a two-way collaboration informing each other. A university network helps ensure all institutions in the network become relevant to all. It is a starting point for university and inclusion in a global network. Equally, universities that do not normally make policy or engage with policymakers need to be brought closer to the policy process to contribute, for example, to SDGs. It has been to des described to me by one, by one Thai government official who deals with the university as knowledge maximization, which makes use of higher education's collective intelligence. Who would want to ignore that? Because SDGs go beyond socioeconomic outcomes, they require an expanded role for universities and their partnerships. <coughs> All universities have to play a role in achieving SDGs. And someone in Thailand, again, uh, an expert on development, in fact, described it in this way. The university has to become an SDG organization. Now let me describe one salient example of how they do this. Permit me because this is how it works in practice. Southeast Asia, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, is currently building a joint platform of university groups, uh, university bodies, government bodies, NGOs and industries in order to tackle SDGs. The aim is to provide a higher education platform that can capture knowledge so that it can be accessible to all the universities and all the countries in the, in the group. And they will help ensure higher education stays relevant as things change rapidly. A common space for dialogue that would ensure all voices are heard in a region like Southeast Asia, which has a very diverse range of economies, is very important. It has some of the world's richest countries, like Singapore, alongside smaller, less developed economies like Laos. The aim is to jointly set goals, then someone can take a leak. And maybe some can go slower, but that doesn't matter because the important thing is, thing is that they would have that shared vision and would pull their resources as they work towards it. But just by having these meetings of universities, university groups, government departments, regional organizations, and so on, they are reaching some kind of understanding of how universities, if they collaborate well, can contribute to SDGs and bring to these goals their own regional but inclusive identity to make them relevant to all. And finally, just for those who feel it's too big, it's too much, how do I start? Oh gosh, SDGs, it's too big, too airy-fairy, too complex. But step by step, it dawned on even the smallest universities that they do have a role. And by the way, it was often their own students who reminded them. The initial step is to think, however small the institution, what are they already doing? Excuse me. Um, that actually aligns with SDGs. What have they been doing already for gender, for poverty, for peace, for alliances? And they always found something, whatever little thing. And within their university groupings and beyond, that has become their speciality. And they develop it and they bring it to the group. And the groups of universities that have embraced them 
are the ones that have become truly inclusive. I actually find it quite amazing that we're still reminding universities to consider gender, equality, diversity, and inclusion issues even now. Even now. If they are to have any kind of influence or to force or force or leadership, they need to be doing this now and they must be rep and they must represent all to be relevant to all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yajna, for bringing, raising so many relevant questions and uh, uh, talking about impact and inclusion and the relevance for us to be good work for the good of all. And um, for us to consider also who are we leaving out and how we can work in cooperation, something that is very important for us as a network. So I would like to invite now with Scott Williard to join us for his talk. Uh, so Scott is president and managing partner of the R.W. Jones Agency, a strategic communication and marketing firm serving more than 70 colleges and universities worldwide. One of Scott's specialization is helping university clients reflect institutional values throughout all forms of public communications. Scott sits on several boards, including at the World Quant Public Relations Group, an international consortium of public relations firms in a K-12 school district where he resides. Scott holds a master's degree from Columbia University and bachelor's degree from Old Turbine University. Please, Scott. Thank you, Rector Alameda, and it's pleased to be with you again uh, for this session. I was asked to provide uh, a, a few remarks about effective access to the press. Uh, and as mentioned, our agency works with about 70 institutions on everything from scientific research promotion to institutional communications. And we're often asked from our smaller regional colleges and universities uh, how they can increase their press coverage, or more acutely, how do I get on the front page of the New York Times? There is an answer that we always tell folks, and that is take hostages. <laughs> and after the, the laughter dies down, um, you know, we talk about that's the right question to ask, though. Uh, because in the United States market, Jeff Salingo is a higher education reporter that wrote several uh, years ago that there are a total of 5,300 uh, institutions from beauty schools to Harvard in the United States. Harvard enrolls just one-tenth of one percent of college students in the United States, but you would not know this from the media attention that they certainly receive. Uh, there is significant inequality to access in the media. So, what's a college to do? Uh, in my short time here, I'm going to provide you uh, three things here in the next five minutes that I'm hoping that you can take back to your campus and have conversations with your communications chiefs and consider implementing. But before I jump to those three points, uh, I've got two questions for you all to ask yourselves as rectors and chancellors uh, on the evaluation of your communications functions. First is at the highest level, our senior communications leaders reporting to you, or are they reporting to other senior members of your team? Reporting to a rector or vice chancellor aligns a communications leader as one that has some institutional positioning, rather than reporting through advancement or admissions, which clearly have other goals. Number two. Is your communications team strategic and proactive? Or are they mostly reactive in trying to put out communications fires? You're going to need both. It's this, there's not a, a one size fits all here. Uh, but if you do not have a communications as central part of your branding and marketing strategy, they need to be in the room with you. Most everything that a university does or touches in some way revolves communications, messaging, branding, institutional positioning. 
And if you're not there, and many institutions are not there, uh, I would consider you all to think about what it would mean to elevate that position at your university. So with this in mind, I'm going to talk a little bit about the three strategies for institutions with strategic operations. You've got, you've got, your, senior, your, you've got your senior team there, they're reporting to you, um, or a trusted advisor. The first thing is before contacting the press, your communications office should ask, is, or does this coverage help reinforce your institution's strategic plan? If I had my journalist panel here, they would back me up on this, but journalists get a lot of junk in their inboxes. Um, uh, a lot of what leaves university communications offices are football scores, announcements for lectures, um, and if one didn't know anything about universities and just perusing websites, uh, people would think that we're in the events business. Uh, but we're not in the events business, you all are in the ideas business. And institutions should be spending staff time on ideas and the things that matter. Not events, low-level communication that's not having impact. Now, I understand that institutions need to produce this type of internal information, uh, and there's ways to do that. But this is not information that needs to be sent out to journalists. Number two, pick up the phone. Uh, those who aren't Harvard have to work at it. We have to work that much harder uh, for uh, journalist coverage. When journalists call, take the call and err on the side of communicating. This is going to help us build relationships with journalists when problems arise and problems will arise, uh, but it's going to establish a credibility as a trustworthy partner. When not so nice stories come up, you will have an ability to do as the media panel suggested yesterday on having side conversations with journalists and asking them to really think about the story that they're getting ready to write based on the information that they have provided to you. Lastly, and maybe most important, um, you are your own media. And so gone are the days where media were exclusive gatekeepers. I was looking at some statistics the other night, and there are YouTube influencers with 115 million followers. Um, in the States, we're lucky if we get 20 million people watching the evening news combined every evening. But years ago, I told institutions to pitch journalists first and think about stories for their own websites Second, uh, now you develop your own strategy and journalists will come along for the ride. Crudely, there are four different what I call messengers that universities have and it's what we classify as what we call a peso plan. Paid, earned, shared, and owned. Uh, and what I mean by messengers, these are ways to get information out to your key audiences. Paid is the advertisements that you buy. Earned are the pitching of journalists and, and, uh, and, and regular media. Shared are all of your social channels that you use to push information out. And then owned are channels as your own website, your own magazine, your blogs, you, uh, to be able to push information to individuals. We have to stop thinking that earned media is the only strategy. We need to bring this back to a more holistic strategy. And there's um, I, several of you do this well. I know most closely of the University of Rochester who has really gone, uh, undergone a transformation within their communications organization to bring this front and center. Lastly, I want to leave you all with this. Uh, there is no panacea for immediate coverage that is going to drastically increase. You, you cannot pay an agency an even larger retainer 
uh, to change your reputation overnight. It is through, uh, though I guarantee some folks are going to try. Um, but this is a steady drumbeat for an institution. Over time, you can begin to be known for the things that matter at your institution. Going back to the take hostages comment. We're not looking for coverage for coverage's sake. Uh, we're looking for coverage in the right areas, about the right programs, about the points of pride and our institutional values. There are, are dangers here to applying, we call a microwave solution uh, to a crock pot situation. And so the way for increased media coverage specifically comes over time. Uh, having something to say, dedicating some time and resources, developing that strategy, and understanding your institution defining stories and campus's strategic plan. The rest is noise. Leave the noise alone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott, for joining us again and uh, allow us to think about uh, effective access to the press. So thank you very much for the tips and all your suggestions. Would like to ask our panelists to join us. Uh, Alan is with us as well. So we can take a couple of uh, questions from uh, our audience. Who would like to start? Please, Bill. Uh, yeah, Bill Flanagan from the University of Alberta. And my question is for you, Ellen. Really enjoyed your talk uh, and uh, your recent piece in the University World News on the Times Higher Ed Impact Ranking. And of course, you make a familiar argument. The rankings are junk. <laughs> They're terrible. They drive inequality. And, um, and, and perhaps we should ignore them. But I, my question to you is, what do I say to my board of governors that cares deeply about rankings? What do I say to the 20% of our students are international students? What we can charge in the way of tuition is directly a function of our ranking. In our case, that's $150 million a year. Uh, and the recent uh, Times Impact Ranking, we participated in it for the first time a year, a year ago. We came in at 64. This year we paid more attention to it because, as you know, it's largely submissions, and we, we leapt all the way to 11. And of course, we made great hay of this. <laughs> and uh, so what do I say to my faculty that care about rankings, my students that care, my board of governors that care deeply about rankings? And we all use them when we engage in research partnerships with one another. The first thing we do in looking at a potential partner is look at the rankings. So we're all, we, you know, we're, we're up to our eyeballs in this. And it's also a racket, as you say, because these ranking agencies sell the data so that you can improve your ranking. So all of this is true, but how do we get out of this? <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Uh, Hel Ellen? We, we cannot hear you, Ellen, please. I think you are muted. No, I'm not muted, no. Oh, you're, okay, now, now we can hear, now we can hear okay. you. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. And uh, thanks for the question. That really is the, um, what do you call it, the, the thousand dollar question or the million dollar question of how do you get rid of um, something that everyone else believes in and really know deep in your heart that it's, that it's valueless. Um, I expect the advice I gave to my own minister for education is, is it's um, important to follow them, but not to be slavish. And um, so they are a fact of life. They're an ex extremely successful business model. I was urged by someone else to try and get myself on, onto one of these boards. So I do declare I'm on the university, uh, the U multi rank advisory board, but um, to try and see, could I shift the indicators? No, they've got a very successful business model and it's even more successful because it's about selling the data. And um, that's indicated also in the, in the new link up, be, unfortunately, between Times and Inside Hire, which is a very good paper, but it's unfortunate. But um, so that's my advice is not to be slavish, not to run around you know, ranking should be an outcome of your strategy, not the not the driver of your strategy. 
So they sit in the background. They shouldn't inform resource allocation. They shouldn't inform the way in which you look at which which areas of um, research you focus on, which would lead you ultimately to um, really abandon the arts and humanities. They don't figure well in citation counts and um, really focus on those areas um, of STEM that, that do. It would, uh, it would push you to, in fact, move away from everything that Joanna has, has said about equity because what you don't want them to, to do is to um, enroll any students who come outside the mold. The reason Harvard gets its, all its attention, it's an elite institution and the media focuses on elite institutions and elite students who go on and do well. So if you are as a university genuinely interested in equity, then you need to look at policies that are, as I said, mainstream, holistic, part and parcel of everything that the university does and that it works honestly and directly with the community in which it's based. I expect I raise a fundamental question which I raised yesterday and which is largely the title that I then gave to it is are uni were universities working in the public interest or their self-interest? Have they confused these? And I think that fundamentally is where we need to go. They are a fact of life. Put them on the side, keep them in the closet, and focus on what you need to do. Can, can I continue? Sure, sure. Go ahead, Yaja. I think it's gone even further than that now, and it's gotten out of hand, and it was always out of hand in my view. Um, I don't know if anybody's seen the uh, new British uh, visa for high-end STEM talent. Now, you qualify for this visa for high-end STEM talent by being on a rankings list. You have to be from one of the top 50 universities on this list. And they've got four lists up, the, the usual suspects. You have to be on two of those lists. To, to So in fact, if you look at the bottom of those lists, I think the top of the lists are all the same. Uh, if you look at the bottom of the list, then you know, you might actually fall out of the list. Now, the worst thing about it is that it there isn't a single African university on that list. And most Asian universities aren't on that list. And the, for example, I'll give you an example. Uh, the Indian Institutes of Technology, which are, there are, there are 23 of them in, in, in India, which produce some of the top, top engineers uh, in the country and indeed in the world. I mean, the, all, all of um, the, the tech industry in, 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 in the US uh, is headed by um, graduates from the IITs in India. Now, they would be excluded from this list, for example. So where are we going with these rankings? Who are the top 50 universities? I, I feel very, very, very uneasy about this. And uh, just in the last couple of weeks, I think, another country has followed suit, and that is the United Arab Emirates. They are using a very similar system based on rankings for, for visas in, uh, for high-end uh, um, STEM researchers. Yeah. Well, just um, on those points, I mean, absolutely, I would agree entirely. And we have had too many um, governments looking at how institutions are funded based upon the rankings. And that effectively has increased the inequality within countries, which is now higher than it was. And if we don't care about those issues, we need to care that our public, the increasing rural urban disparities, the political implications of it, and universities now being caught in the middle of a really contentious and increasingly um, really very, very critical um, nationalist political uh, social upheaval in many, many countries, all of them being affected. So these are issues that ultimately come home to bite us. Thank you. Any other question from our audience here? Yes, please. I'm not going to criticize anyone mm -hmm. or ask a question. I just wanted to make an interesting comment because of what you said about the impact of universities. If you know the history of African universities, you know that in successive 
epidemics, now it's a pandemic. For example, in Ebola, African universities didn't come to the party in, in any way. But what was fascinating was when the when the uh, COVID came or when the, the, this, this latest pandemic came. Now, at least 35 universities, I remember doing an interview for the BBC, on the BBC for this, 35 in African universities came to the party in a very large way to contribute to the effort. And for, for the first time demonstrated that universities can be relevant in epidemics, in disease, pandemics and others. So much so that many African governments now are taking a, a good look at how they should fund research in African universities. So for example, recently the South African government is asking universities to bid for a pandemic preparedness institute. Mm -hmm. uh, we have all bid, uh, I think I know what the result is going to be, <laughs> but <laughs> What, what, what the process of bidding did also, especially for my university was, we started thinking of collaborating with other universities in South Africa. We normally would not think of collaborating with, or rather go off to Bristol, to Southampton, Sheffield, come here and have collaborations. But now when we put up our bid, it had five universities with different historical backgrounds, from the privileged to the underprivileged, given the divided history of our country. I was also fascinated internally with our academics in health sciences. When you talk to academics about curriculum transformation, they often you might get all sorts of excuses and how long it will take. But our health sciences transformed their curriculum at the beginning of the pandemic in weeks and introduced elements in community health to deal with the pandemic. As a result, we've been given the right been given the responsibility to vaccinate immigrants, undocumented immigrants, um, asylum seekers, and people like that. So that kind of agility, if you like, uh, I think must characterize impact, not waiting for all of the time, but actually rethinking, actually, and reimagining how a university might be immediately relevant to its context. So, uh, so I found your, your comments really fascinating in that regard and made me think of all of these examples of universities in Africa, you know, manufacturing, you know, sanitizers and 3D printing, you know, materials for health workers to work safely in hospitals during the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Any, any other question for our panelists or comments? Please. Representative of the media, <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to say something about um, media, media strategy. The best thing you can do is to use this knowledge base and to explain. And I think what universities need to do is to make their university leaders available and to make their experts available and especially the experts which are very good, at, who are very good at communicating. Actually, practice makes perfect, tell you the truth. But, uh, but if they have something to say, people will listen. So if you have university experts who can talk about the subject in hand, that's half the battle. And only the other half of the battle is having someone that the governments will listen to at the same time. So I think that is your strategy. Always be open up with the right, know who your experts are be aware and very quickly of what's going on around you and offer uh, those experts and have your university leaders able to comment on the bigger picture, maybe government, government policies and so on. And then journalists will get to know who you are and what, what kind of things you say. And I think that is the best strategy. And just finally, you, you know, make them available on the day. D don't write me an email and say, oh, sorry about this, but she's not available until, you know, two weeks hence. Y that's it. Y th you failed full stop. You will never be in the media. <laughs> that's true. The difficulties for us presidents is having our community want to talk to the media many times because you're so busy in their labs and doing their work, they, they don't want to be interrupted. But I know it's something that we do have to do, you know, to show our community how important it is to talk to the media and, and how important it is to be available as well, as you pointed out. Yes. Yeah, yeah maybe Alan. I might just, yeah, sorry, maybe I might just um, refer to the um, initial examples 
th that it were given by by both Jan and the other speaker about university engagement in terms of what they're what they do. This is really the big issue, both um, with regard to research and general the the societal civic engagement agenda. And it is an agenda that really goes to the heart. It's not about, um, with all due respect, broadcasting how good you are. It goes deeper than that. I think a lot of universities spend a lot of time on the idea of public talks and public lectures. So broadcasting, no, it's about genuinely doing engaged with their communities working with them to solve problems. And as you pointed out, the SDGs are themselves, what's important about them is that all the problems are global and that they're in everyone's community. They're not somewhere else. And um, it is that level of, of working with, involving the community directly in the ideation of projects through the design, through the assessment, and so on, and, and in teaching and research, the internment ships that were mentioned, work-based learning, all kinds of, of changes in the way in which the university engages directly with its community, I think is really vital. And um, those I think are really important issues around equity and ensuring itself that the university doesn't find itself an island in the midst of the rest of society. Thank you very much. So I think we, we, we have two questions. So oh, three. Oh, OK, please. Um, thank you so much. Uh, my question is to uh, the news agency. You know, as much as we in academia, we want to speak on radio and be in the newspapers, the journalist also wants to sell his or her paper. And the other scenario is when you talk to, who do you talk to in the university for you to title it University of Ghana says this? And that has been a, a, a big issue. So I can have a research finding, I talk to a, a, a journalist, the next day University of Ghana does that. But I spoke in my personal view. We all expect that when the rector talks, it's on behalf of the university. But for an individual, how do we manage it? And, and that is where academia, we don't want to interact with journal. Th that is my observation. Because mm -hmm. anything you say is, is claimed is for your university, but not necessarily. I mean, how do we address this? Thank you. Scott? It's a very good point. And I think it's one of these things that is quite difficult because as the leader of your institution, People are looking, uh, especially in today's age, and your students want to know that your values reflect their values and that the institution can somehow have you know, specific values. Um, let me give you an example, though, that we're, that we're facing right now, uh, and especially in the States. We're getting ready, I have a feeling, to overturn Roe v. Wade. Many institutions uh, in the United States have a background where they are funded by uh, specific churches. Um, they, are, they have very conservative boards, very liberal student bodies. And so what's some of the messaging that we have worked on uh, with, with some of, um, for some of our presidents recently is coming out to say, I'm not speaking on behalf, I mean, this is actually the quote, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the institutional stance on Roe v. Wade, but I'm telling you, uh, as a president of an institution, you know, I cannot support it. I can support it, wherever their position is. Um, and being overt about highly political uh, circumstances on, if you've got to come out to say something, because your internal communities require it, uh, being overt that this is your point of view. The other thing that I would make sure of in this situation, and this is what we've told all of our presidents, is you need to be in sync with your boards as to what comes out, because invariably what will happen is your comments are going to be linked back to the institution, right? And you should, th you should think through with your communications chief 
uh, the impact of this? The, the best answer may be no answer because we, we don't wanna say anything that links us to this highly charged political event. Um, and, and that would be something that you all can, can certainly talk about before you issue any statement. But it's a tight rope to walk, uh, but you can make it very overt in a statement that, you know, and, and this is what they did at, at Reed College and several other places where they were saying, the president said, I'm not speaking on behalf of our institution because uh, for every person that believes the way I do, others don't and we believe in the value of diversity and inclusion, and we believe in having these hard conversations. Uh, but she felt the, the need to really state some things and get it up front so her students knew exactly where she stood. Thank you, Scott. So I think we have, oh, would you like to say something? Mm -hmm. Very quickly. I think it's perfectly okay to say, uh, if you're being interviewed, uh, however, this is my personal view, not necessarily the view of the university. But having said that, you are speaking on behalf of the university. I think it's, even if students speak, they're their, they're their university ambassadors. And I think, um, I, I wouldn't worry so much about it, actually. <laughs> uh, you, it's protecting your university. If you're the University of Ghana, somebody's hearing about the University of Ghana instead of somebody in the United States or Australia or whatever. You are projecting a university view from Ghana and from Africa. And I think that's a relevant voice to be heard. And this is what I was talking about when I was talking about inclusion, talking about Ebola. Um, the, 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 the person who was expert on Ebola and who spoke all the time on Ebola uh, became our, <laughs> our, our spokesperson, scientific chief advisor to the government in, in the United Kingdom, uh, a British person from the, from the uh, um, uh, Institute of Hygiene and Tropical Health, um, Professor Valance. He, uh, so he was the Ebola expert, but he was also he also became our our main spokesperson on on uh, the pandemic. So yes, Africa wasn't there, but Africa what did did African universities were able to step up, as I mentioned in my talk um, uh, during the pandemic itself. So as we have uh, run out of time, I'm just gonna listen to two questions here, and then I'll go back to our panelists so that they can have their final thoughts. Bill and uh, who was the other person, Mike? Mm -hmm. Somebody else wanted to Yeah, my question was for Professor Dudley. Uh, my area is international trade law, so I'm familiar with the challenge that you outlined. But what I would suggest is the culprit here are the international organizations themselves abusing their elite status by offering unpaid internships. Now they know they can do this because these are extremely elite opportunities as you outlined. They're gonna get the best students in the world from the countries that can afford to send them. But they're the ones who are creating the problem. Should we be advocating for these international organizations to cease relying on unpaid internships? And are you prepared to do that as a member of one of these organizations? There was another question somebody else had uh had raised your hand before? No? So I'm going to pass on the word to Dear and then to all the other members our, for their final, the panelists for their final words. Yeah. No, thank you very much. I mean, I think that's a great question. Um, it is true, and that's recognized. Um, and part of um, um, the reason why there has been a, 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 a slight movement, uh, a change in culture, is precisely because there is actually a movement to try to put pressure on international organizations um, to do away with unpaid internships. Um, uh, some organizations, like WHO, um, now in fact have a stipend in response to the pressure, right? So it's not a, a, um, a purely unilateral uh, voluntary decision. It's because of the amount of pressure that has been placed by a number of organizations um, uh, to actually do away with um, um, so with uh, these unpaid internships. So you're absolutely correct um, that international organizations um, uh, are for the most part to blame. Um, that doesn't mean though, I think that there isn't a responsibility on us as institutions because in a sense, we want to promote our students. We want our, institu our own students to be um, uh, part of these organizations in order to influence um, that helps us also influence. And so I think there is nonetheless a responsibility on, on us as institutions to think about ways that we can make sure that our students um, are part of this. Um, certainly my, my, my own personal um, 
view is if, if I have the resources, of course, I pay, and hence uh, I mentioned that this year is slightly different for me because I've been able to get some resources. But that's not going to solve the more generic problem, the big problem. Um, so I think it is important to sort of start thinking about how we can, um, um, how we can change this uh, at a much larger scale. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, your final comments on access to impact and influence? I think I'm. I think in light of the fact that um, there weren't many questions for me, I think I'll just stop there. That's that's that's. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you very much for being with us, Jana. Um, yes, on impact and influence, I think it's very important now that universities begin to understand the way they impact and influence, and not worry so much about whether they're having an impact or, or, or influence. Universities' greatest impact is that they are the repositories of knowledge, and a lot of people don't understand things. What I find really, really interesting, after the financial crisis uh, in, in 2008-2009, we had a lot of people who really understood um, you know, the jargon of financial crisis, right down to the per person in the street. During the pandemic, everybody understood <laughs> you know, the jargon of uh, uh, transmission and those kinds of things. And it came because uh, universities were able to present experts who were trusted to know um, in a way that m helps people understand that. It's a very, very important public good. To, and I think that's where you have to understand, okay, we are going to have an impact, but we're going to do it by putting ourselves out there and not worry so much about who's picking it up. Thank you very much. Ellen, can you give us your final comments on the topic? Okay, um, sure, thank you. And um, again, apologies, I couldn't be with you. Um, I guess with all the, the focus on, um, I'd like to focus on teaching and learning, which is really one of the main missions and sometimes is forgotten in, in this um, push about um, the importance of impact on higher education. We always focus around research and telling people about innovations and so on. The fundamental mission of higher education is teaching and learning. The biggest product are our undergraduates. They're the biggest number of students who come out. And in many countries, rightly or wrongly, questions are being asked about the relevance of the graduates, the skills, capabilities. It's not just a higher education problem. It's not just a higher education issue. It's a shared agenda. And um, issues around that, I think it's also a conversation that higher education should be involved in, in a shared way with its community, collaboration, collaborating with further education or VET, and working with its wider regions, in its sub-regions is what I mean, to help solve these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Scott? Addiction uh, here is is really teach the world something, right? And you all are doing such an incredible job with your undergraduates and graduate students. Um, and take it upon yourselves to work with your communications offices to uh, help further teach the world. Uh, and if we all knew a little bit more about the world that we live in, I think it would be a much better place to live. Um, and it can start right here uh, at, at higher education institutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So please join me thanking the panelists for this excellent discussion. <laughs>